uh, thank you, Kim, for inviting me to give a talk about immunotherapy. Uh, my role within the University of North Carolina is actually melanoma specialty. Uh, so you would ask yourselves why a melanoma doctor is trying to give a talk in renal cell. And the answer is uh, supposedly we are seeing the melanoma docs are seen as Melanoma doctors are seen as uh, doctors from the future for what is going on in the field of renal cell cancer, which lacks approximately one to two years in development uh, in relation to what is going on with, um, with uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma. Does anybody dare to say what this looks like? Patients-wise, not, uh, not doctors. So I tried to find a picture in the internet about uh, how a cancer cell looks like and how lymphocytes look like. So I want the patients to understand there is a size difference between what's a cancer cell, which is usually a big thing, and how these tiny little things are trying to go against the, the cancer cell and kill it. So we have a size difference. And sometimes number of cells, of immune cells, and uh, function matters. Okay, so the talk point is that um, since it's Christmas, I'm going to give you a couple of books for recommendations, books for Christmas. Uh, uh, it's, I'm going to try as simple as I can with respect to describing what is a normal immune system functioning, because a lot of lessons from the normal immune system functioning, you will answer yourselves about what are these drugs that are coming out in the renal cell carcinoma mean and how do they work. So. An important aspect of what is immune surveillance and immune editing. So, uh, and then uh, what are the mechanisms of cancer immunity and suppression? Just to explain the variety of different mechanisms that exist and why uh, immunotherapies is not one size fits all. Uh, I will also would like this audience to remind the high dose bolus IL-2. It is no longer a sexy drug as this has been out for 20 years, but nevertheless should not be overlooked uh, as uh, progress goes by. And then uh, the future for now is immune checkpoint inhibitors, and that's what we're going to talk in the end. And, uh, and then the question is whether the future is for, ze for everyone. So these are the books for Christmas. Uh, the left uh, side book I read it when I was a resident 14, 15 years ago. Uh, it is written very uh, almost 15 years ago, so there's not going to be any excitement about the recent advances of immunotherapy, but it's going to give you a very nice history of immunology and immunotherapies in cancer. Uh, you will see all this drama that has happened over the last 100 years about questions like that a scientist had, does the immune system work or does not have it all? So we had a lot of ups and downs throughout the 120 years as to whether the immune system plays a role. So there's a nice, nice book here, pretty big, like 300, 350 pages. Not an easy book to read, but uh, I would therefore recommend. And the other one is uh, the one I'm trying to finish when I'm going back and forth to work through an audio book. This is a generic history of cancer book. Uh, does not talk about a lot of immunotherapy, but again, you're gonna see how doctors and researchers are by all means human beings and they're having their own biases and how progresses are being made. Uh, um, so the purpose is not to explain you how normal immune system works, but show you that basically, we don't talk about immune system in general, we talk about two different arms of the immune system. The one that is less relevant for cancer, less relevant for cancer, and the one that is more relevant for cancer. So this is the adaptive immune system. Uh, the, our immune system needs to remember what a cancer cell is because it's a non-self. So it's not something non-specific. And the key to all this, um, the key is the interaction of these cells that are called adigen presenting cells. These are the cells that pick up stuff that is non -fo that is non foreign from the from the environment. This can be viruses. This can, this can be bacteria. But yes, it can be cancer cells because cancer cells are non self cells. So these are sampled from the microenvironment and are being presented in these antigen presenting cells. And it is this key interaction with these other cells that are called lymphocytes that you saw in the very first slide that uh, is the key to educating the immune system. Okay, so that's a different uh, way of seeing the adaptive immune system. Fancy picture where antigens are being uh, picked up at these antigen presenting cells. These are 
called dendritic cells from the Greek word dendros, which means uh, tree. So they have these spi spiny projections. And it's again an uninstructed, naive T cell that is going to come and encounter the antigen presenting cell, and then it's going to get activated. And either it's going to kill the cells, or some of them are going to be left behind for memory. So that's a very simplistic uh, approach of what is adaptive immunity. And again, the key interaction here is the interaction between the antigen presenting cell and the lymphocytes. So here's your first a kind of complex slide, but the way I'm going to present it is, is like, it's basically the interaction between the antigen presenting cell that I showed you before and, and the lymphocyte, a T cell, is actually so complex that over the last 20 years there have been so many molecules that have been uh, identified to play a role in this interaction. And it's no longer a simple interaction of a signal that means that this antigen presenting cell is going to present the antigen and, oh, the immune cell is going to get activated. The decision, so it's no longer one what's called first signal. It is a number of other things that the interaction between these two cells have to be taken into account. And whatever is in red, it means that these are actually proteins that are going to say, no, I'm not going to get activated. And then those things that are uh, green, these are the cells that say, yes, I'm going to be activated. So the net effect of whether a, an immune cell is going to actually get activated is the net result of the positive and the negative factors. And it's easy to understand that this looks to me like a complex car with multiple brakes and gas pedals. So that's how complex nature is. And, all of, and uh, right away, you're beginning to see things that you may have seen already on the internet. You're seeing things like CTLA-4. So there's already a drug against CTLA-4. It has been used for renal cell cancer. It's called Yervo. It has not been approved yet. Uh, also, you see these other uh, negative uh, immune checkpoint protein that's called PD-1 or PDC one that is, the that is the target for nivolumab uh, or uh, pebrolizumab, pebrolizumab that was FDA approved for melanoma three months ago. And then whatever you can see in red, it means that there are already drugs in development. So it is no longer just the PD-1 that you see or the CTLA-4. There are a bunch of actually targets that are currently in clinical development. So this is a very hot area of interest. So there's going to be more to come over the next five to seven years. Um, okay, so uh, this is the gas pedal scenario in normal states. So if you have two gas pedals and one brake, then it's a go. And that's a nice looking car that actually makes a turn and does not go upside down. And this usually happens when there is an early stages of an infection. Our immune system has to become activated. Uh, very simplistic the way present, but this is a, way, a good way to understand how it goes. And then when the immune system takes care of business in the normal states, then all these, uh, several of these negative immune checkpoint proteins are being upregulated, and then basically you have your car nicely parked, uh, ready to be used for something else. Uh, so I want people to understand here that cancer and the immune system, there is constantly an interaction. I uh, remember I was a third year medical student in Greece when our pathologist said, our body makes approximately 30,000 cancer cells per day. And the only reason that we don't develop cancer is because we have a constantly working immune system. So, so there is always this tendency, the Darwinian tendency of our bodies to, be, to develop mutations, to become something different, to evolve over time. But there is constantly this system that's called immune system that is trying to seal things off. So therefore, any conditions can turn a normal tissue into a cancerous tissue, and by definition, the cancerous tissue is slightly different from the normal tissue, and that is perceived as foreign, as a non-self by the immune system, and in so doing, the immune system is trying to eradicate those cancer clones. And then there is this constant uh, interaction between how a cancer becomes genetically unstable, develops new mutations, okay, becomes more different, and how it actually tries to suppress the immune system and how this battle between the immune system and, and, and cancer is going on and on. And that has been, and that probably has been going on for years and years to come. This is not an overnight event. And eventually cancers develop because the immune system has failed. So when somebody has cancer, it's basically a failed immune system. 
So there's not some, anything to fix it. It's not like if you increase your exercise or you increase your activity or you improve your diet or you get a supplement, it's going to get better. It is already broken and therefore there have to be ways to restore in the way of drugs. I believe in alternative medicine, but um, the effects of it are very well unknown uh, in a patient with metastatic cancer. So, so again, will the future be one size fits all? I just talked to you about one way that the immune system is suppressed, and that is by upregulating these breaks. But there are a number of things that are going on. There are many different ways that the family can become dysfunctional. And I, I quote one of the very nice phrases that uh, Alexander uh, Tolstoy has wrote in Anna Karenina. There's one way that the family can be functional. People would be happy and, you know, you know, kids love their parents and vice versa and everybody's happy. But there are many ways that the family can become dysfunctional. That is how cancer is. There are many different ways that your immune system can become suppressed. So here we go. So if the cancer cell does not upregulate these HLA molecules, the ones that require for the first signal, the immune system is not going to see it. And therefore, that's how cancer cells evade the immune system. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to produce all these molecules that basically suppress not only those cells that are supposed to pick up these antigens and instruct those lymphocytes, but suppress pretty much everything, suppress the antigen presenting cells, but suppress the uh, immune uh, cells as well. And guess what? Many of these things that are being secreted by the cancer, or when the lymphocytes come in, in contact with the cancer, it can be a toxic effect. So as this nice review article from Tessa Whiteside, who was my neighbor in uh, neighbor office in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, she says, immune cells in the tumor microenvironment are functionally impaired, and I'm, and I'm adding, and are killed. So your lymphocytes are getting killed by the cancer, uh, by, the, by the cancer cells. And you all are patients and you understand how to read a complete blood count uh, test. But what I want to emphasize you here is I'm going to show you, I'm showing you eight different patients, CBCs, simple as that. The common with these patients is that all of them have metastatic cancer. And the one thing that makes a big, big uh, interest is that the fact that all of these uh, lymphocytes are low. So there is a fundamental pro problem in most of patients uh, met end stage cancer that their lymphocytes are low in the blood. Okay. So for people who know, who don't know what is a high dose bolus IL-2, it has been FDA approved therapy for 20 years. It's not for everybody. It is uh, a very uh, toxic therapy. Not everybody can do it. It is being given in uh, hospitalizations. Uh, this is called a hospitalization is called the cycle. Two cycles include a course and we can evaluate things with, between uh, every, every two courses. Okay, so, uh, so this is what IL-2 does. So this is our very first patient that was treated uh, at uh, the University of North Carolina with renal cell cancer. So what you can see here is that before he got into the treatment, his lymphocytes were low. And then when he started to get IL-2, his lymphocytes disappeared. And that's what IL-2 does. Makes the lymphocytes disappear from the blood and they're going to different parts of the body, including the cancer cells, and they're supposed to eradicate the tumor. And what happens is when uh, the cycle ends, then the patient shows up right before the, uh, the next uh, dose and his lymphocytes are almost double right before the second course. So what I want to emphasize, again, do not forget drugs, that, uh, drugs like IL-2. So IL-2 is otherwise called T-cell growth factor. I call it a T-cell steroid. If patients in the way of immune suppression is actually they just don't make a lot of immune cells, IL-2 could be a very good drug to give. So the same thing now, but now I have this thing there, which means that the cancer cell can actually immunosuppress because it can also uh, develop properties of antigen presenting function. And then all, all, all of a sudden you see that the, you know, the, can, the, the, the lymphocyte can take instructions, wrong instructions from the cancer cell. As you can see, there are more breaks that the cancer cell can induce as opposed to, uh, to uh, gas pedals. And this is now the scenarios when somebody has cancer, okay? So 
you may have advanced cancer and your first signal is uh, functioning and you have two brakes in one gas pedal and therefore you're looking like a Formula One car that is on high brakes. But uh, if, for example, your immune system, uh, it, the cancer does not have ex expressing those things that makes the cancer cell visible, then you're like a car that is driving in the middle of the night without knowing where things are. And you can have the third situation of immunosuppression where things are functional, but the cells are dying because the cancer is suppressing them. And this is a car on fire. So what the immune checkpoint inhibitors in renal cell cancer, uh, and that seems to happen in 50% of patients with uh, renal cell carcinoma, is that you may actually be able with one of these drugs to eradicate one of the two gas pedals, and that could be sufficient for uh, uh, the immune system to get activated. And sometimes if you use two of them at the same time, okay, and uh, this is the PD-1 plus uh, the uh, ipilimumab, then the, this immune system is really revved up to the point of going up in the air. So um, this is uh, a most updated list of clinical trials using these immune checkpoint inhibitors in various cancers. And I want to show you the renal cell cancer in relation to other cancers. So what I want to show you is that if you use these two drugs, the epilimumab and the nivolumab, in various doses, okay, uh, in combination, you can rev up the immune system to such an extent that you can see response rates of as, as high as 44, okay? Um, now, if you use only nivolumab uh, in renal cell cancer, then the responses are less, but nevertheless, much better for responses that you get in other cancers like lung cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, um, so what I, want to, uh, what I want to emphasize is that different cancers would respond to these drugs in different percentages. And um, it seems that the renal cell cancer behaves in terms of response rate similar to melanoma. So again, see where the epilimum and involvement was given in patients with lung cancer, the response rate was only 16%. So what are the benefits and challenges of these new class of immunotherapies? So definitely uh, the way we see that in melanoma when epilimum was approved in 2010, we were able to give immunotherapies in a much larger uh, number of patients. We were giving epilimum in a 90-year-old. We were giving epilimum in a 70-year-old with congestive heart failure we will be giving epilimumab in somebody with coronary artery disease. IL-2 cannot be given in those patients. So the, the, the application of immunotherapies will be much larger in a larger group of people, the same way we saw that in melanoma. What else would be convenient? It's going to be an outpatient therapy. You don't have to be admitted for this horrible five-day course of high-dose bolus IL-2. And in fact, if you come to the MICU, the Medicine Intensive Care Unit at UNC, you're not even gonna have a bathroom. So uh, uh, it is definitely less toxic, okay? So that's, that's no questions asked. But again, we have to see the less toxicity um, in a different uh, perspective. The benefit of IL-2 is that you will do it for two months or four months or six months, and then you're gonna be done. With these kinds of immune checkpoint therapies, potentially the side effects can be longer lasting in particular if you use the combination of epilim one and evolumab. Will they be more effective? So we, in our mind, we have linked response rates that I just showed you with, uh, 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 with clinical benefit, which is progression-free or overall survival. The trials are too early right now to say whether this high response rate would actually lead to longer survival, but it's very safe to think this way. Uh, but unless we do follow these trials over a longer period of time, we will not be able to know the long-term benefit. And uh, the challenge is, we're talking about drugs that are, it's $20,000 um, an infusion here. So we should do a better job, we as doctors, to really refine which patients actually are candidate for. And I think I predicted that this 
combination of drugs can be effective in up to 50% of patients, but definitely not 100% of patients. And for how long we're going to give these drugs? So right now, the drugs, uh, at least the approval of the pebrolizumab for melanoma is basically indefinite. So as long as you have cancer and you respond to that, then you're going to be getting pebrolizumab forever. Is that the right thing to do? I mean, this is, provides a huge burden to the, uh, to the insurance companies and the healthcare system. And again, as I said, does response rate correlate with long-term benefit and what's the cost? And how to combine these drugs with, with uh, uh, other drugs. And I intentionally did not do that because I would wait for you to make uh, your, co uh, your questions in the uh, panel discussion. So my summary and conclusions is that future is for some, but definitely uh, more than the lucky IL-2 candidates. So you shouldn't be privileged uh, because most of you, you will be candidates for both of these drugs, the epilimumab, uh, uh, sorry, the pembrolizumab alone or in combination with uh, Epilimumab, um, but not one size fits all. That I have, I have, I think I showed you that there are many ways that cancer, i.e., the family, can become dysfunctional, and this is one of them. And do not forget that there are also good old drugs, so tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Can some of them? I've seen that they have response rates 20, 30, 40 percent, and people have been on that for years and years uh, to come. Uh, and there are also high dose bolus IL-2 that you should not forget. Um, but if, um, if the patient is not um, uh, if, is in an advanced stage of disease, you just cannot beat up an, a dead horse uh, with any immunotherapy, in which case you have to use other types of treatments. So these treatments are not for everybody. So uh, I thank the six, seven patients and their families who have trusted us to give them high dose bolus IL-2 in the hospital. And I'm sure that they are eager to see something less toxic than IL-2 and uh, the GU program that uh, refers patients to us for this. Thank you.